the song. Competition's none in a league of my own. All about the W, I'ma bring it home. When it's over with, I'ma be the king of the throne. Welcome to the Empire's preseason podcast series, where today we will be covering the LaSalle Explorers. I'm Benjamin Simon. And I'm William Derry. LaSalle returns after a very disappointing season that was capped off by a 15-15 record. There was a lot of hope coming into last season after returning most of their guys from the previous season and gaining three big-time transfers, but the team never meshed and couldn't find a groove. This year, head coach Dr. John Giannini will look to flip the script with former Syracuse forward B.J. Johnson and former Memphis guard Pookie Powell leading the way in their second year um, playing for the program. Now, Will, when we're taking a look at this roster, someone you don't see is Demetrius Henry, who decided to turn pro. Would you imagine that it would, of anyone on LaSalle Explorers, it would be Demetrius Henry uh, making an effort to turn pro and B.J. Johnson staying back for his senior year? <laughs> Not at all. I think that a lot of fans of LaSalle's basketball team thought Johnson would be the one moving on to the pros and Henry would return for his final year with the Explorers. I think it was a shock to everyone that Henry turned pro and left the program. Of course, the situation between him and Coach Giannini was not a positive one, and I guess they came to a mutual understanding that it would be best if Henry would move on. Now, as for Johnson coming back this year, I think that it is great for the program and it's one of those things where you know everyone was unsure of if Johnson would move on or if he would stay but I know that Giannini and all of Johnson's teammates were ecstatic when Johnson decided to come back for a senior season. Oh yeah for sure I mean Vida Johnson is one of the best players in the um, City Six last year not to mention the 810 um, where he we all know he can score um, and he'll be a matchup problem for any of the fours that come out to stick him if he does play the four. And even threes, um, at 6'7", he has an NBA-level body, I, I think, um, If uh, in terms of size, I mean, height and length um, for the three position. Um, and anywhere he needs to improve is the defensive end. I agree. I think at times last year, his focus on the defensive end wasn't there. We all know that he has the build of someone who could guard the four and with the way the basketball is being played these days, probably the five. And I think that with him, it's just going to come down to effort. Johnson, yeah, we know I, he's going to. I agree. We, just, we know that on the offensive end, he's going to put the ball in the basket. We understand that he could also initiate the offense. He can create a shot for himself. But for him to make the move to the next level and to help the Explorers win a few more ball games and hopefully compete for a conference championship, he has to put in the work on the defensive end. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it had a negative 1.4 box plus minus last year. Um, and it was clear that defense was where he struggled. Um, and I think it really held um, less, it held LaSalle back when your two best players, Jordan Price and B.J. Johnson, aren't getting after in the defensive event. With that said, however, um, in a preseason interview with uh, uh, Philly.com's Mark Narducci, um, B.J. John, uh, Coach Janini. Uh, um, talked about uh, um, B.J. Johnson as more focused on the defensive end, putting more effort on the defensive end in this, uh, in this offseason. And he, he, he acknowledged the fact that he did put in effort last year, but he, he said specifically that the focus was there more this year for B.J. Um, in the preseason and that um, he had really made uh, defense a focal point of his improvements uh, over the offseason this year. Um, what I'll be cur- more curious for BJ is how good he's going to be without Jordan Price or if not having Jordan Price is going to hurt him. I agree. I think that last year, if, if, if last year is any indicator, I think Johnson should be okay. When Price and him both played together on the floor and just together as the season went along, you could see that Price kind of shied away from being the initiator, being the guy who ran the offense, and Johnson stepped up and took over. I think that uh, last year Price's stats suffered because of Johnson, which isn't a bad thing. I think, you know, for LaSalle to get to what they did last year to become a 500 team, they needed Johnson to be the guy. And I think Johnson should be fine without Price. What, I th- what I'm really excited about and looking forward to with this team is with Jordan Price not being on the floor and having gone on to play in the NBA G League is this should open up opportunities for guys like Amar Stukes and Pookie Powell and Johnny Shuler to step up and should honestly I think 
the ball should move a lot more because Jordan Price, as we all know, kind of wasn't the most passive guy. He liked to do a lot of one-on-ones <laughs> and, and shoot the rock. So I think that uh, it should allow LaSalle to have better ball movement and not to become, not become real stagnant in offense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, that's actually, I think that's actually a good point because, I mean, Jordan Price took 12 shots a game last year. And that's no small. That's most no small number, and it was down from years past. I think that tells you a lot about um, Jordan Price's game. Uh, they're gonna look at someone like Pookie Powell to really step up. Um, Pookie spent, you know, the thing about Pookie last year, it just never. It, he seemed to never really get comfortable with the beating part of the season when they really needed him to be comfortable. Um, it was at the end of the season where he really got it together, but at the beginning of the season, you know, it was like almost every other game's a single point digit game. Um, you know, he's playing in the 20s um, and then really started to kind of get it going um, and scored, uh, you know, eight, uh, seven of his eight games before he got injured uh, with double digit points. Um, and then got injured for uh, six games and then came back and um, he, he picked up where he left off, uh, scoring double digits uh, five of the last seven games of the season um, and then playing 30 plus minutes in the last five seven games this season so it was, you know he got that comfort level out the way in the first couple games um had trouble was kind of in the doghouse um and i think he got that out the way um we know pookie's gonna score he's gonna have to score and we saw that he could score last year um especially with like a 27 point game um against villanova the better question is i i think um are they going to be able to play three? You know, it seems like their five best players includes Johnny Schuler, but you can't play three point guards on the floor. So, you know, you assume Johnny Schuler of the three point guards is going to come off the bench. Um, will there be a time, you think, that we see those three, you know, not very big guards on the floor at the same time? Possibly. You know, I like Johnny Schuler. I think that, you know, he can also score, get to the basket, and, you know, can run the offense. So thinking about having Amar Stukes, Pookie Powell, Johnny Schuler all on the court at the same time, I think it's, it's possible. You know, Stukes is probably the best defender out of the three of them, so possibly playing him at the three and guarding the other team's small forward. And then with Pookie Powell... <laughs> it's a tough task. Tough task, but I think Stukes is up for it. You know, I think some people um, have been... Um, Hesitant to give Mark Stukes the credit, but he had a great season. I, he was, that's a good point. That's a good point. You know, in my opinion, I agree. I, think I don't. He, I don't think. I don't think people give Amar Stukes his fair credit. Yeah, and I think you know, especially last season. Last season. Yeah, yeah, the year, I can understand that his first two years with the program, he didn't <laughs> yeah. you know do as well as a lot of people hoped because you know he went to LaSalle College High School, so you know he was a yeah. local guy, and people thought that he would come and you know. Hit the, hit the ground running. So he, he struggled his first two years, but last year I believe that he was LaSalle's most improved player. He showed that he can play defense. He could also score the ball because I know we looked at his stats and you know he would have games where he would struggle scoring. He would take 10 shots but only hit two of them. So I yeah, think that... Different, a different story last year. Different story last year. So I think Amar Stukes can guard that three. Of course, it's not, you know... Ideal, but if you're going to play with three guards, Schuler, Powell, and um, Stukes, I imagine Stukes will play the three. Powell plays off the ball, and you know I think he'd be fine playing off the ball and let Schuler, you know, play the one and let him set up Stukes and uh, Powell. In that case, you would have to go with two two big men. I mean, they're lucky they got a seven two guy um, because they would have to have some rim protectors to go with that line. I'm looking at someone like Tony Washington, um, redshirt, uh, the redshirt freshman um, Sullivan um, from Ireland. Uh, you're looking at a guy like uh, Miles Brookings maybe stepping up, um, especially if they go with that smaller lineup. Um, and then there could be times where they go with a bigger lineup with, um, you know, you're saying Pookie, um, some combination of Pookie, uh, Johnny Schuler. Amar Stukes at the one and two, whoever's you know whoever two are feeling it. B.J. Johnson at the at the three, and then you got Sullivan, Brookings, Tony Washington of filling up the two big men spot. That's a, now that's a big lineup. So you go from a small lineup to a big lineup. Yeah, and you know I can definitely see that lineup. I I'm really excited to see what Tony Washington has to do this year. What well, has yeah, in store for yeah. us? He's a he's a senior. He's been in the program for a while now, and 
you know, I think this is the year where his stats should increase. He should, you know, take on a larger role. And I don't know. I like I, I know last season he wasn't, you know, the best rim protector. But I think this year with Henry out of the way and taking, you know, he took some of his shine last year. I think Washington should be able to step up in that big man role. And I'm really excited about uh, the freshman, Miles Brookings. He came into this. Yeah, yeah. He came into this um, preseason uh, unknown. You know, he went to a pretty pretty big program out in California in Mater D. And, you know, he's a six foot 10, 207 pound center who played against the son of Manute Bowl, who is a top five recruit in a class of 2018. And, you know, he's he has the experience playing in big games. Uh, just yesterday when LaSalle played against Seton Hall, he came up, came in off the bench and produced down low. So he's definitely ready. I don't expect him to start in front of Washington, but don't be surprised if you see Miles Brookings down the line come in and, you know, take, take some minutes from Washington and give him a blow. Or, like you were saying, if they want to have a bigger lineup, have, move B.J. Johnson from the four to the three and play Washington and Brookings together. I think that would be a huge lineup. And then he throw in uh, sophomore, soft Fury in that. Like you said, it's one of the bigger lineups I can imagine in their conference. Yeah, you could play. You could actually even play Fury at the two. And <laughs> that's a big lineup right there. You know, you put a Mark Stukes six two at the one. Uh, that's that's a big lineup right there. I, I didn't even think about Fury in the, in, in that sense. Um, yeah, it's Tony Washington's a guy that I really think needs. They're going to need a lot more from this year. Um, I think everyone expected a lot more than they got out of him last year. Only play, only played 16 minutes a game, and you talked about that kind of taken away from Henry, maybe. Um, and he averaged only 0.3 blocks a game with his size and length. They're going to need a lot more in that because, um, I mean, the struggle last year for LaSalle was defense, and having a rim protector is going to be really important. Um, for Tony Washington, um, I think maybe even asking him to score the ball a little bit more um, because they're just going to need that. I mean, it's, they don't have Cleon Roberts, they don't have Jordan Price, um, and at his size and his experience now, um, they're going to need more than 16 minutes a game. They're going to need more than um, just uh, 0.3 blocks per game. I mean, that's just that's just kind of ridiculous. Um, they were one of the lowest teams in blocks last year, 13th in the conference. Um, you know, and the other thing about him is, you know, Tony Washington played 16 minutes a game and averaged almost three fouls a game. Like, that's something that they're going to need from him this year is you can't get fouls early. You just really can't um, because that's – with the lack of depth that they have and the lack of experience, especially in the front court, it's just really going to hurt them. Yeah, I agree. I think last year there was a couple of games – I know the one game we went to, Washington seemed to get into foul trouble and had to come out early. So this year we, they can't afford for Washington to you know get into foul trouble and to sit on the bench, even though they have a little bit of cover in Brookings. Besides Brookings and Sullivan off the bench, they don't really have any other size. So they need Washington to stay out of foul trouble and to and just to compete and, like you said, step up this year. I think if he steps up, LaSalle could uh, go pretty far. Yeah, and um, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, we're talking about, well, not even really shifting gears. We're talking about depth and um, where the depth is on the team. Um, looking at this kind of fifth starter, you know, I think most people will probably agree it's going to be Pookie, Amar Stukes after a strong, um, after a strong junior uh, season, um, B.J. Johnson, and Tony Washington starting. The question is who's going to be that fifth guy um you know could it be a guy like Sal Fury um could it be a guy like um could it be a guy like uh Isaiah Dees um who are you seeing playing that role well I think it could possibly be Deeds or Fury I'm leaning towards Fury because of his size and I think last year we saw such a small sample size that I'm interested to see what he what he's made of I think he has a pretty nice shot for mid-range and his size could really complement this lineup and having you know him in the lineup could help them on a defensive end now as far as scoring and just someone who's a pure 
baller and someone who can attack the rim. I think you go with Dees if you're going more offensive. He he only started two games and only played in 17 games. And I know you mentioned to me earlier that he had some problems academically. So that's something to keep an yeah. eye on. Before his but freshman year. He got it together, though. Before his freshman year. Yeah. for him. And I think he showed flashes last year of potential. Uh, he had a big game against uh, city rival Temple. So he's not... He's not afraid to, you know, play against play. He's not afraid to show up in big games. So I think that you know either one would work. But I think early in the season that they probably will vote Fury just to play more defensive and just to build that foundation. But don't be surprised if Isaiah Deeds starts some games this year. Maybe he won't be the starter every game. But I think if they're trying to play more offensive and trying to score points, you could definitely see him starting. Yeah, I mean, Isaiah Dees is bigger than Cell Fury in terms of height at 6'6". Six, six. Um, Cell Fury is only 6'4". Cell Fury is 2'10", though, um, which is, you know, significantly bigger than um, Isaiah Dees at 185. Uh, you know, someone else uh, that I think... Uh, well, I, I agree with you. I think Cell Fury is going to start. Um, I think that he provides a lot of things that they need and fills a lot of holes for them. Um, you know, Coach Janini obviously was a fan of Isaiah Dees. Um, starting him in the first game last year. Um, but Self Fury brings the ability to knock down shooter. Um, he's 6'4", 210, uh, could be a, honestly a go-to defender. Um, and I think that uh, he's someone who uh, went to a really good uh, prep school um, at Putnam Science Academy, um, played with uh, Mamadou Diara and Hamadou Diallo, um, who's now at Kentucky, and Diara's at... Uh, um, UConn, UConn. Um, and uh, you know he, he's someone that uh, could fill the role of being an off off ball shooter. Um, could be a, a a three and D guy for sure. Um, and I think that would be really important, uh, really important, uh, really important for the uh, LaSalle Sports. Yeah, I agree. I think that you know having those guys, having someone who's played against that type of competition should be able to factor into the lineup and we'll have to see i think that coach giannini is flexible at times with his lineup and this year he's gonna have <laughs> and I think he definitely year, is flexible he's definitely flexible he's definitely flexible he's not you know afraid to pull guys i know he no, said he's not. Many, no he's not many times on the a10 teleconference calls that if they're not showing up in practice or not performing in practice then they're not going to play on saturdays and throughout the week so I think we could see different – we're going to see multiple lineups. And, you know, I think either player should, you know, be a good fifth starter. And whoever is not the starter is going to hopefully be a good reserve for them. Yeah, for sure. And you brought up reserves. Um, looking at this team, uh, I mean, I just I'm, – I'm wondering who's going to be that kind of spark plug off the bench that they're going to need. You know, I think it's going to be Johnny Schuler. If Johnny Schuler is think? not a start – I think, you know, if he doesn't start, he's going to get plenty of minutes. And I think that with Schuler, I think it's all about, you know, him getting the playing time. I think sometimes when right. he may not be in a group because he hasn't played for the last three to five games or he's only been playing uh, 10 minutes. So I feel like with Johnny Schuler, if Giannini puts him in a certain role and just sticks with him in that role, I think Schuler could be really productive for the Explorers. Yeah, I look at someone like um, Jameer Moultrie, the freshman point guard. Um, now, I understand that he kind of comes in a tough situation with LaSalle already having um, three very solid point guards. But, I mean, this guy was a pretty big recruit. Went to Bishop McNair, um, in, uh in D.C. And, uh, you know, in his, in his junior year at, at the school, uh, averaged like 17 points per game. Um, shot 42% from the field, 40% from almost 40% from three. Um, 80 per 84 percent from the line um, had offers from Butler, UGA, Mammoth, who made the tournament la uh, last year, or no, just missed the tournament last year, um, but was last team out. And uh, Rhode Island um, had some interest from uh, schools like West Virginia, Virginia Tech, um, George Washington. Um, he's a guy that uh, that I think has kind of flown under the radar these last couple of weeks and. People haven't seen him been talking about him or being excited about him, um, and I think he's someone that could provide a spark plug off the bench, um, which I think that they're definitely going to need because I think of someone like Johnny Schuler as a 
as a point guard and a ball. You I mean you talk about this, you know, controlling the ball, but I don't necessarily think of him as a spark plug or a scorer. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I think that Schuler is more of a distributor and not really uh, a great scorer. But you know, I can see him being a productive guy off the bench and hopefully giving them. Not an offensive spark, but just being a ball handler or someone who can run the offense when Stooks and Pookie Powell are uh, on the bench resting. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I wonder if he's going to get pressure from Moultrie um, that people might not have expected, you know, um, previously. I think that Moultrie could maybe push him for that point guard spot. I mean, Johnny Shula, that is, off the bench, just because the way that um, he'll be able to, I think, score more than um, uh, Schuller can. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see who steps up and is that backup point guard. And just to further Moultrie's case, one fun fact is he was named to the All-WCAC, along with Philadelphia Sixers, first-round pick, Markel Fultz. So he's uh, definitely, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's someone who's, you know, made a, made a, had an important high school accomplishment with someone who's, you know, in the NBA and who had a solid freshman year at Washington last year. So Moultrie, someone who he may be, you know, a little undersized at six foot one and 170 pounds, but he's from Washington, D.C., and he was a four-star recruit coming out of high school. So I think that we'll, we'll see throughout the season a battle between Moultrie and Schuller for minutes off the bench. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, looking at the um, the schedule this year, um, just wondering where we see you know LaSalle stacking up against this this uh, the schedule that I think is an interesting combination of teams. I agree. You know they have an early season matchup against Penn, and you know Penn has AJ Broder, who is a he's a beast down low, just to put it plainly. Yeah. He's someone who. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to He's going to give LaSalle words. trouble. He's going to give LaSalle trouble. He's going to give LaSalle trouble just like he gave everyone in the Ivy League trouble last year. He is someone who you just can't you can't watch enough tape on and you, you, all you can hope to do is slow him down. He's someone exactly. who can hit a 3. He shot really well from 3 last year. He can play defense. He's a legit rim protector at 6 foot 8. Two and a half even blocks, though he's two and a half blocks per game. I mean, he, he was an Ivy League player of the week about six or seven times last year. So Tony Washington and Miles Brookins and probably B.J. Johnson, they're going to have their hands full. And we're going to find out, you know, what that front court is really like when they go up against Penn. And then um, they have the Nate Smith Hall of Fame tip-off tournament where they play against Northwestern on ESPN3. And then the, the next day on November 19th, they either play Texas Tech or Boston College, depending on if they beat Northwestern. So I think the Northwestern game is going to be a great game to see and measure where LaSalle is. What do you think about the early season tournament? Yeah, I think that would be, an, I think it'd be an awesome um, opportunity for them to um, resume boost and uh, really just see how good they are. I mean, I think the Penn game is going to be super important because – LaSalle's expected to beat Penn, and they've lost to them the last couple of years. Um, and the expectation every year is you have to beat Penn because of just, you know, where Penn kind of is, you know, not able to give scholarships. And I think it's always a disappointment when uh, fans or even the team of LaSalle loses to Penn. Um, and Penn's a good basketball team this year. It's at the Palestra. It's on NBC Sports Philadelphia. This is going to be a big-time game in the second game of the season. And I think could be a big spark plug for a team like LaSalle who really needs that. Or I think it could be kind of a big confidence uh, crusher. Like, ah, we lost to Penn in front of everyone. Um, and I think that that's going to be really important for, uh, for, for LaSalle to win that, win that game against Penn and go into that um, Naismith uh, Hall of Fame tournament with um, the com- you know, confidence and the swagger that they didn't really kind of have last year. And then... After the, the Hall of Fame tournament, they go and play versus Miami and Reading, PA, which I think is interesting because Lonnie Walker, who was a big recruit from Miami, is from Lonnie is from Reading, PA, so um, neutral location. Um, of, you know, I think obviously to give Lonnie Walker a chance to go home, even though I don't even know if she, he's going to be playing because he's injured. Um, and then they play Temple, a game after Miami, and then they go to Belfast and play Townsend and either Manhattan or Holy Cross. So. 
that's a pretty packed non-conference schedule. And then obviously they go uh, Drexel and then at Villanova um, before uh, getting into A-10 play, playing Mercer and Bucknell before getting into A-10 play. Um, that's a pretty interesting combination of teams for LaSalle. Yeah, I think John Giannini did not hold back this year. He did not uh-huh. shy away from scheduling tough, nationally televised games. And I'm hopeful that the Belfast trip will allow them to come together as a team. They're going to be going over to Ireland. They have a center on the team in Sullivan who's from Ireland, so it'll be a, it'll be a homecoming for him. Maybe he can show him around, show him his, uh, his country. And I like this schedule. I think that it's a difficult schedule, but they're going to be pushed to test every night, and hopefully it'll help, it'll will them on to, you know, bringing it every night. Because I know last year they struggled to maximize their effort in every game. But with this schedule, they don't have a choice but to come out every night and give it their all. Yeah, I wonder. I think that the... Uh... I think that the Belfast tournament, I think, is a, it was a good schedule because obviously they're going to Ireland, great bonding experience. Um, and I think after playing like five, four straight legit teams, Northwestern, either Texas Tech, Boston College, Miami, then Temple, you play Townsend, Manhattan, Holy Cross. You know, I don't know how many games they're going to win out of those four prior to the, the Belfast tournament. Um, so I think, uh, you know, going up against Townsend and Manhattan or Holy Cross in the basketball Hall of Fame class, you're playing against some solid competition, and I think a chance for them to get back on track if things didn't go the way that they wanted in those last four games. Yeah, it's a tough schedule, and then, you know, it'll definitely prepare them for cop- for their conference schedule later in the year. Yeah, and I think really important is you're going to play some teams like Penn and Temple um, who have um, legit big men in A.J. Broder and uh, Obi and Echionia. Um and I think the key is you're going to have to I mean I said this earlier keep Tony Washington on the floor and find someone like Miles Brookings to play um, we saw in their law, in their scrimmage loss to uh, Seton Hall um, a t- uh, t- top 25 ranked Seton Hall actually um, Tony Washington only played 6 minutes because he had 4 fouls in 6 minutes you just you can't do that if you're Tony Washington they need him on the floor they're lucky they got good minutes from Miles Brookings who played um 19 minutes um, and had seven points and five boards and um, you know they're going to need that out of him and and it's uh, glad to see that uh, Coach Giannini had the confidence in him to play uh, play him um, as Tony Washington struggled with fouls yeah I know that's one thing that we brought up earlier in this podcast was can Tony Washington Washington stay out of foul trouble and play more than six minutes play maybe 15 to 20 minutes at least they need him on the floor and yesterday's exhibition against Seton Hall was not a good showing for him but hopefully he'll bounce back when they play against Chippensburg Um, you hope that he can have a good game in that exhibition so that when the season starts he'll you know hit the ground running yeah for sure Um, and I think it might be interesting just based off their Seton Hall game yesterday um, you know, Miles Brookings only played 19 minutes. Tony Washington only played six. Who who else played the minutes at the five? Um, and I think that we could see them maybe even going with a lineup where your biggest guy is B.J. Johnson. I mean, that's a matchup nightmare for the opposition. Um, defensively, they'll obviously have some trouble, but Saul Fear is a big fella. Um, and uh, B.J. Johnson six seven and long. So I wonder, you know, if you might see them going with that really small ball lineup. Um, and again... It's all going to fall on B.J. Johnson. Will he be able to produce on the defensive end and really hold the defense together when they go small? Yeah, they're going to ask a lot of B.J. Johnson this year, but I think he's ready for it. I think that's part of the reason why he came back this year is to take on some of the load and to be that senior leader that they need. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how he um, how he handles um, you know, being the guy this year. Uh, without uh, without Jordan Price here, and how he handles the, uh, you know he's the he's the clear go to scorer. He's the clear um, basketball and on the court leader, um, and he's just going to need to uh, provide more intensity on the offensive and defensive end. I think for them to win it and and bring more of that intensity that we didn't always see last year from the team as a whole. I agree. Yeah. Um, do you have anything else to add? I would just say that LaSalle, their schedule is tough this year. I think that 
Coach Giannini did not hold back this year and just because maybe he doesn't have the deepest roster he's ever had coaching LaSalle and last year was not the year he wanted to have. They only went 15 and 15. I would just say that a lot is going to a lot is going to be on Johnson and Pookie Powell to lead this team to some victories. I think that the early se- the early season matchups that they have against tough teams is only going to better them from better them for when conference play starts. So, I think that this year I see LaSalle possibly winning a few more games than they did last year, 16 or 17 victories. So, I think it's going to be a very exciting season for them and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll be interesting to see how this team messes in really. Um, you know, hopefully they can finally get it together after some down years. Uh, but thank you for listening to the uh, the Empire's uh, season preview podcast of LaSalle Explorers. Um, we'll be doing a season preview of every team in the form of uh, a written um, explanation of where we see the team kind of fitting together and then also doing a podcast series um, for each team talking about what we should expect this year. And um, that will be coming out with every team. Um, comprehensive uh, season preview. Um, uh, thank you for listening to the Empire's edition of um, LaSalle Season Preview. I'm Benjamin Simon. And I'm William Derry. Thank you very much.